Hi, everybody. I want to uh, thank you all for uh, joining us today. Uh, my name is Michael Eichberg. I am the executive director of the uh, Henry Wheeler Center for Emerging and Neglected Diseases here at UC Berkeley. Uh, that's a center dedicated to promoting research and education in fields uh, relating to infectious diseases uh, that have recently emerged uh, and or remain understudied and underaddressed in, in many parts of the world. And really Ebola is one of those types of diseases that the center was uh, really established to look at. It emerged only 30 years ago, which is a, a, blink, uh, a blink of an eye in terms of uh, the history of disease pathogenesis and it's indigenous to uh, several resource poor regions in Africa. It has also been neglected suffering from uh, limited attention by governments, researchers, public health professionals, and drug developers, in part really because until recently, its a disease burden was very, very small, uh, especially when compared to scourges uh, such as HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis. Uh, however, Ebola has surprised us, and it's caused one of the most substantial public health crises in the last uh, several decades. It was this surprise that led to the idea for our event today, entitled uh, Roots of the Ebola Outbreak. Uh, the idea behind this event was to move beyond the immediate crisis and really ask uh, why now and uh, why here in this particular region of West Africa. Only by answering these questions can we advance our understanding of this outbreak and hopefully prevent future outbreaks uh, of Ebola or other similar infectious diseases in this region and uh, elsewhere. So I want to thank uh, uh, welcome all of you and those, again, watching by webcast, what we hope will be the beginning of addressing these questions. And I want to welcome and thank our participants today, uh, all Berkeley faculty. I also want to apologize for the fact that Jamie O'Connell, our speaker from the Bolt School of Law, could not attend due to a, due to a family emergency, uh, and we wish him and his family the best. Um, also wanted to thank our co-sponsors, the Center for African Studies and the Center for Global Public Health, as well as the Bonato Institute for uh, uh, giving us the room for this event today. I'll now turn things over to our moderator, uh, Dr. Ava Harris, for opening remarks. Uh, Dr. Harris is a professor of infectious diseases in the School of Public Health and also the faculty director for the Center for Global Public Health. Dr. Harris is one of our leading virologists on campus. She's dedicated a large part of her career to dengue, one of the most, the most prevalent uh, mosquito-borne uh, viral disease in humans in the world, and a, a neglected disease, really, with truly massive uh, health impact. She's also an important advocate for uh, building sustainable, local-based scientific research and solutions uh, to infectious diseases. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Harris. Great. Thank you very much, Mike, and thank you all for coming out today. Um, I wanted to just give a couple opening remarks in terms of what we're uh, trying to do today. and I. This is, uh, the Ebola has suddenly become kind of, as, as Michael said, one of the kind of unprecedented in terms of the severity and intensity. And, and I would say in terms of our unpreparedness. Um, and I think that that's a really important point. Um, I mean, it, it looks like contagion and hot zone come to life. Um, and, and, and it really is. I mean, it's, it, but I think that what it really sheds a light on is um, how unprepared the world has been, especially the regions that were the hardest hit. Um, many of us who work in these areas know this and have been saying for many years that we need autochthonous capacity, but it's something that people don't really want to hear about, at least foundations often don't want to hear about because they want to fund, as I always say, gadgets as opposed to people. Um, and I think that this particular epidemic has really shown the need for autochthonous capacity in country, um, not only people, but also actually public health and medical infrastructure. Um, but you can see what happens when that doesn't exist. Uh, and so, um, I mean, it's the bull. I mean, it is true, and I think it's important we realize that yes, there are in fact four million deaths from from respiratory acute respiratory infections. There's 1.7 billion cases of diarrheal diseases, leading to 750,000 deaths as well. And Ebola is actually, in terms of the numbers, is much smaller. Um, but it's very intense and, and certainly very media grabbing. Um, and I think instead of looking at the negative, what I wanted to um, to turn around is like, what is the positive that will come hopefully from this? And I think part of that has is about um, essentially shedding the light on the need for a public health infrastructure. Public health tends to be something you just kind of assume is there and you know it better just be there preventing. And, and if it's not, then that's only when you see the, 
the lack. You never see the presence. You only see the lack. And I think that this is something that's that's very important. And it was interesting. I was at um, the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene meeting last week in New Orleans, and I happened to be a counselor. And uh, Bill Gates was our keynote speaker, and he came for a private discussion. And so we were able to actually converse a little bit about. Of course, everyone asked about their disease. So naturally, I asked about dengue. And Dan Bausch was there, who's been in a lot of the media, um, who works on Ebola, asked about Ebola. And um, and Bill got really riled about this because he, you know, about how bad the response had been. And he said, you know, it's not. I would give us a B plus actually on the response. What I would give us a D minus for is on the preparedness beforehand. And 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 I I thought that was just so interesting because <laughs> we've always had this kind of standoff around you know, the the whether you invest in, again, the gadgets or the, the interventions or also in the people and the infrastructure. So it's really interesting to hear from you know, Bill Gates himself the, the recognition of a need to have autochthonous capacity and infrastructure. Um, and I think he was also referring to uh, the coordination efforts. Like, in other words, if we were unprepared in terms of who would step to the fore in terms of coordinating the response. But I think that on both sides of those, um, it's, it's really important. And I think a positive that might come out of this is, is again, that, that need to have a certain level of autochthonous capacity and infrastructure in place um, so to avoid these in the future. Um, the other thing that's been interesting is to see, um, and hopefully this is something which is borne out in a positive light as well, is the working together that's come out of this. And I think, um, again, at the, at the meeting last week, there were some talks from FDA and from others, and it's actually amazing to see these agencies trying to do something innovative <laughs> and to work together. And, and for instance, the FDA and, and WHO, and they're actually in, in record time getting vaccines and trials and, and coordination across agencies in a way that has been uh, very difficult to achieve. So kind of taking things that would take years into months into weeks and, and having the ability to try different innovative strategies um, for vaccine trials and for just in general coordination strategies. And so hopefully that's something Thing that doesn't die, um, you know, once this is is over, which hopefully will be soon. Um, the the curves are in fact, you know, well, I'm actually Art's going to tell us about this, but they're they're starting to come down a little bit from that that essentially 90 degree epidemic curve <laughs> heading straight up to the heavens. And so, um, we'll, you know, this is definitely what we'll be talking about is kind of why why it happened and and what's happening from here. So what we decided to do with this uh, um, panel was really instead of uh, focusing as many have focused to, to date on kind of the disease and the epidemic and the response to actually take a step back and say, you know, what are the roots of this epidemic? And, and, and we have a kind of really interesting set of panelists um, who are coming from epidemiology, but also from a uh, professor of wildlife ecology and conservation, as well as a professor of anthropology. So we're really looking at issues of um, essentially what, what the cultural um, structures and beliefs and the civil society and then also the whole ecology and bushmeat utilization, et cetera, and how that's been impacted and how that will impact, you know, in the future. Um, but first we're going to have, um, a, this, we'll have Dr. Um, Art Reingold, who is a professor of epidemiology, um, and he is um, in the School of uh, Public Health, and he's also the Associate Dean for Research um, at the School of Public Health here at UC Berkeley, and he's also the Associate uh, Faculty Director of the Center for Global Public Health. Um, and he's our, one of our leading infectious disease epidemiologists at Berkeley, and he's been essentially a point person, poor thing, for a lot of the media attention um, um, on campus, um, and also just uh, for education on campus, but he's also been involved with the CDC and the WHO in actually developing the response to Ebola. And so he's gonna provide us with an update on the current status of the outbreak in the region, ongoing efforts to treat patients and break the transmission chain and help place this event in the context of previous outbreaks and the public health infrastructure needed to contain it. So with that, I'll bring um, Art up to the stage. Uh, well, good afternoon. I'm going to keep my remarks relatively brief. Uh, what I was asked to do is provide a little bit of context about uh, Ebola and from an epidemiologic and public health perspective. Um, and so what I thought I would do is spend just a few minutes for a little bit of history about Ebola in the past and then where we are with the current epidemic uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the epidemiologic features. So uh, this is a picture of the virus, the first picture ever taken of the Ebola virus taken in 1976. It's a fetal virus, is that right, Eva? Okay. Um, it's all the virology I know. Um, and, and this is simply to say, as many of you know, uh, since 1976, there have been about two dozen outbreaks of Ebola, uh, and they have occurred across a band in Africa that I'll show you in a minute. They've ranged in size from only one case 
uh, in the past up to several hundred cases, but nothing remotely like the scale of the current uh, epidemic that we're experiencing. Uh, and this uh, map simply shows where these uh, outbreaks have occurred in the past, uh, and people have noted that this is a very similar map to where yellow fever occurs in Africa. I actually don't know that there's any other connection, but, but they have noted that that is a very similar map. Um, and I borrowed a few slides from my friend Don Francis, who was involved in the very first uh, response back in the 1970s uh, here in southern Sudan. And just to give you a flavor of why it's perhaps been easier to control Ebola outbreaks in the past than it perhaps has been with this one, because this very first Ebola outbreak occurred in a, as many of them have, in a remote rural area. And so this is the area in South Sudan where the outbreak occurred, uh, and it's obviously quite remote and far from, from cities. Uh, and um, this was the, uh, quote, you can't see this very well, but this was the isolation hospital. These thatched huts represented the, the hospital. Uh, these are a couple of the graves uh, in South Sudan, a grave of one of the nurses. I guess these don't project very well. But the point is that historically, these outbreaks have occurred in remote areas. Uh, and as a result, the control efforts have been able largely to succeed by isolating uh, people with Ebola and preventing transmission to other areas. And this obviously becomes a much more difficult issue when you're into an urban environment, uh, as the current outbreak is. Um, this is simply, these are again data taken from this first outbreak to show that uh, about 35% uh, of the transmission occurred in the hospital setting. So we know that healthcare providers are at great risk from this disease. Uh, about 60% of the infections were acquired in the home, but these were acquired by people providing care to ill individuals, uh, not to people who were simply living in the same home, such as children. Uh, and then there were about a small number of cases where the route or the source of infection was unknown, but uh, there's a fair bit of evidence in this outbreak that these infections occurred in a, actually in a, um, in a factory. Uh, where perhaps uh, the virus was able to get into a ventilation system and be uh, transmitted to people in that particular setting. Um, and these are some of the data, again, from this very first outbreak, uh, basically showing that the risk factors uh, were from touching or nursing patients, uh, and that children sleeping in the same room with Ebola patients did not become ill. And so this whole question of whether Ebola is transmitted, quote, through the airborne route, uh, this is the primary type of evidence that we have that it is, in fact, not transmitted uh, through the aerosol or airborne route. Um, well, again, this is simply showing where the outbreaks have occurred. Uh, I suspect many of you know that at this point, the suspicion is that the virus is primarily found in bats um, and that it, uh, we don't know a lot about how it circulates within animal species in Africa. Uh, but, but the assumption is that basically what happens is that it makes it into people as a result of, uh, of uh, contact with bats, either in the process of killing them and eating them, uh, butchering them, uh, or perhaps from some other type of contact with bats. Uh, but as many of you know, can, and, and Justin may talk about this, consumption of bushmeat uh, is very important in, in many parts of Africa and is in fact an important part of the protein intake of many people is the bushmeat that they're able to capture uh, and consume. So the idea that we would uh, stop, uh, ask people to stop eating uh, animals uh, in the wild is certainly something Justin, I suspect, will address about some of the challenges associated with that. So these prior outbreaks have basically demonstrated that controlling Ebola uh, certainly requires uh, resources. It, it does, as Eva said, require an effective uh, public health infrastructure. It invariably has required a lot of international assistance because that autochronous capacity has typically not been there uh, in the countries that have been involved. But as we've seen in this most recent outbreak, countries that do have a good infrastructure, like Senegal, uh, or that have a lot of capacity, like Nigeria, as a result of various ongoing programs, have in fact been able uh, to uh, deal with a small number of cases and prevent further transmission. So we know that these old-fashioned approaches uh, have worked and can work. Uh, it's just that the, the resources are, are quite uh, missing in, in the countries where, unfortunately, this outbreak has primarily focused. This is simply, again, to point out that the prior outbreaks have ranged up to a few hundred cases. But just to take one country in particular, you'll see that in Uganda, as they've developed additional expertise, uh, they've, in fact, been able over the years to markedly reduce 
the size of the outbreaks that have occurred there, basically through doing the things that we know how to do. So uh, again, just evidence that these things can work. Now obviously the outbreak we're engaged in now is a very different type of animal. This is the very early epidemic curve uh, up through about the middle of or early part of August. Um, and, and you can see that we now, as I'll show you for the data from the WHO as of yesterday, uh, we basically now have an outbreak with 14,000 reported cases and almost 5,200 deaths. Everyone knows that these are undoubtedly substantial undercounts of the likely number of cases that are there. We really don't know how many people have been affected and simply not uh, presented for care. Uh, and of course, a number of these may not be confirmed virologically. Uh, it gives you some sense of the fact that uh, there are large numbers of cases in Liberia and Sierra Leone, uh, a somewhat smaller number of cases in Guinea. Uh, as Eva said, we now have evidence that uh, in these three areas, there are areas where the epidemic curve may be starting to come down a little bit but other uh, areas within these countries where transmission continues at a very high rate. So uh, these are just the epidemic curves. Uh, the, this is Guinea and Conakry, the main city over there on the right. So we have ongoing transmission in Conakry. These are the data for Liberia and uh, for one city in Liberia on the right. And again, quite substantial numbers of cases in urban areas in Liberia. And similarly for Sierra Leone and Freetown, uh, and the current, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, the date range on here. Good question. November 12th. Is, what's at the bottom? November 12th. Well, the, so the, it's up until yesterday, but in terms of how far back it goes, I think that's pretty much back to earlier in 2014. But these are the data as of yesterday, according to the WHO website, acknowledging that those are undoubtedly undercounts. Um, so you can see that uh, particularly in Sierra Leone and in Freetown at the moment, there's, there's certainly uh, still an upward shape to the curve and still large numbers of people just within the last uh, week, uh, large numbers of new cases, large numbers of deaths going on. Uh, and this is the map also basically just giving you some sense within this area about total numbers of cases uh, within the yellow dots or the total numbers within the last 21 days and showing that we still have wide-scale transmission going on throughout these three countries uh, just within the last three weeks. Um, and this is, I think, a very useful metric that basically looks, WHO has established a number of metrics about what they would like to be able to achieve in terms of a response. Uh, they, they're hoping by December 1st to at least have 70% of patients uh, in isolation and 70% of, of bodies being buried in a safe manner and those numbers up to 100% by January 1st uh, of 2015. But this just shows you that in terms of what proportion of, the, of either the Ebola treatment center beds or the, um, uh, the uh, care beds that are in a smaller area, the proportion of cases isolated, the proportion of burial teams trained and in place that are needed, proportion, the number of dead bodies managed in a safe and dignified manner, what proportion of, lab of districts have at least one laboratory that can test for Ebola. So clearly there are many, many metrics being looked at to see just how quickly the response can be ramped up. This is much slower than anyone would like, but it is still a Herculean effort. So what are some of the challenges of this outbreak if you're an epidemiologist? Well, I suspect we'll talk a lot about this, but the outbreak is occurring in three countries that have certainly been through very, very difficult times in the last several decades. Um, so uh, these are countries that on average have perhaps 100 doctors across the entire country before the outbreak started. Over 600 healthcare workers have died so far uh, in these three countries in this outbreak. So a huge impact on the number of healthcare providers. Uh, but, but these are among the poorest countries in the world with very, very few uh, healthcare providers and obviously uh, histories of civil strife and, and political difficulties that I'm sure we'll come back to. Um, these, are, these are countries that do have substantial urban populations, so we now have the outbreak occurring in large urban settings, making it much, much more difficult. The idea that you can find all of the contacts of a case and then quarantine them and follow them for three weeks uh, is a Herculean uh, effort uh, at this stage. We've obviously had continued ongoing transmission now for almost a year as part of this outbreak and a lot of discussion about whether something could have been done earlier or not. Um, 
obviously both the World Health Organization and CDC and others are in the process of trying to do the best they can in controlling it. Uh, I think I'll just skip over that. Um, clearly, as you all know, a, as, as Eva referred to, there's a great deal of work on new drugs. Um, uh, a lot of discussion, I think it's been pretty much decided that there will not be uh, placebo-controlled randomized trials of treatment. Uh, that new antivirals and possibly antibodies will simply be given to patients and then the best one can do to assess their effect. Um, there are at least two vaccines under development. Um, a lot of discussion about how quickly we'll have how many doses. That depends, of course, on uh, how much antigen or how many viral particles are needed per, per, per individual and how many doses are needed to give protection. Uh, a lot of discussion about whether we'll have randomized trials or whether we will use a stepped wedge approach to assessing these vaccines. But the, uh, the basic plan at the moment is to begin uh, putting these vaccines into people in these countries by January or February of 2015. They're currently in a variety of human volunteers in the United States, in Mali, and in, uh, in, in Europe. And clearly there's also a lot of focus on developing better point of care diagnostics so that we can rapidly tell who's infected with Ebola and who isn't. And this is just an article from the Science uh, of, of last week talking about one of these vaccines um, and, and the work that's ongoing here. Uh, this is a vaccine that takes an Ebola protein and puts it into a different virus. And then this is a, uh, a live virus vaccine uh, that would be given, but not a, an Ebola virus vaccine. Um, yeah. Is there evidence of what? So, so I think it might be better if we come to some of those questions a little bit later. So maybe we should just provide the, 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 the three talks with context and then we can engage in much more of a discussion. The quick answer to your question is I don't know about co-infection uh, being important in these folks. Um, my guess is there isn't a lot of evidence one way or another. But why don't we come back to those issues? So I'm, I'm actually pretty much done. I, my summary is that clearly the epidemiologic situation is evolving very rapidly, uh, particularly in response to the Herculean efforts that, that uh, many people are involved in putting into the field, including the healthcare providers from UCSF, UCSF and elsewhere. Uh, but there, there are clearly enormous uh, clinical public health uh, and other challenges that remain, uh, and it's very unlikely that this epidemic will be over uh, any time within the next three to six months. Um, and so let me just stop there. And as I said, I think we'll have plenty of time to talk about lots of, unless you wanted to take, I don't know if you wanted to. It's okay. So anyway, that was my quick introduction to the. to mention the, um, what we're going to do is we're going to actually have three presentations and then we're going to have kind of a structured um, panel with a bunch of questions that um, I'll be posing and then we're going to open it up to the floor. Um, and our third panelist, I, um, I was going to essentially introduce as we go along, but our second will be now um, uh, Justin Bashers and then we have Maureen Ferrum who is actually in Holland and is going to present uh, by Skype. Um, and be present also for the moderated and discussion, be able to answer questions directly. So she will be um, pro projected. But as for our next question, thank you very much, Art. That was a wonderful setting of the scene. Uh, and actually, the, I just discovered that WHO, there's a roadmap um, which is available on the WHO site, and it's actually very informative and kind of also goes you know, describes some of those statistics. So, you know, they're reporting, for instance, 95% of, of their contacts have been identified, but then kind of goes a little bit deeper and says, well, actually, there are, people are only reporting up to 10 contacts. And so it's clear that there's many more that aren't being reported, so that it actually might sound better. But it's, a, it's very up-to-date information and actually kind of dive, goes a little bit deeper. So it's actually a really nice um, resource for those who are interested. Um, but our, our, now we're going to kind of go a little bit, like I said, beyond into the roots. Um, and we're going to look, um, Dustin Bashir is an Associate Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Conservation in the Department of Environmental Science, Policy and Management in the College of Natural Resources here at UC Berkeley. 
Um, and his research has included a focus on the causes and consequences of bushmeat hunting in Africa for many years, um, including in the West African regions of Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. And so he's gonna be talking from his experience um, of the, about the role of bushmeat in many parts of Africa um, and, and essentially its role in the current crisis um, and what this might mean for future outbreaks. So Let's that will welcome Justin. Yeah, thank you very much. So I guess, uh, thank you very much uh, for coming, and I'm really happy to be here. When Michael first extended the invitation, I felt uh, like I would be an imposter up here. I still do, because I don't work on Ebola, really, and I'm not an epidemiologist by any means. I'm up here as an ecologist, but um, as uh, Ava's excellent in introduction suggested, we do work on uh, bushmeat. We work on both the ecological and social context of bushmeat. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And, um, and I do actually think there's there's, uh, there are several important messages to get out to, to the broader community, and, and I'll tell you what those are and, and why I think they're important. Um, I, I borrowed this uh, schematic from a paper that came out, I think, two days ago. Actually, Michael alerted us to it, and I just think it's a useful uh, way to start. So in, in much of the popular discussion about the Ebola outbreak, there have been calls for um, really taking action at this interface. And this is the interface between wildlife and people, specifically between wildlife that's harvested for human consumption, bushmeat, uh, and, and people. And in fact, uh, there have been uh, policies mandated immediately by uh, uh, the uh, Liberian um, the, uh, and, and other governments to call for the cessation of bushmeat consumption. These have gone through quickly. Um, and when we look at the, the popular press, uh, we commonly see statements, including from reputable places like the Times, that these bans are going to change, these bans on wildlife consumption are going to, going to limit uh, Ebola and other outbreaks, um, or that, uh, again, that, that halting this trade of bushmeat, all we have to do is get people to stop eating animals and, and all of this is gonna be okay. Of course, we can count on Fox News for something like, uh, sorry to be political, but you know what we have to do is get these crazy people to stop eating monkeys, bats, and what have you, and we'll be saved from all of this. Um, and then the Washington Post saying, why do Africans keep hunting and eating bush meat despite these concerns? And so there's a real problem here. There's a, 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 as these very mainstream quotes suggest, there's a very deep misunderstanding about wildlife, the role of wildlife in livelihoods and diet. Um, and about what that means about how we might actually go about trying to deal with something like Ebola or other zoonotic um, in, uh, outbreaks or um, uh, other uh, zoonoses, sorry. So I just wanted to go through a few facts. For many of you, this is old, old school or, or unnecessary, but I just wanted to convey the scale of what we're, what we're talking about here. So bushmeat is, uh, and this is 99% uh, of the bushmeat trade is illegal or not, uh, is, not, uh, uh, is not documented in, in any formal way. But by very conservative estimates, we're looking at 17 to 20 billion a year just, on the, just on, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa alone. And again, this is 17 to 20, 20 billion in uh, primarily coming or starting in very rural areas where that money means something, uh, it means a lot. Um, just in the Congo Basin alone, it's estimated that at least 4 million tons of animals are consumed, and that in many rural communities, it's 95% or more. We see similar rates, uh, uh, sorry, 95% of animal protein consumed in households. And so we see the same thing. We work in Madagascar, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana. Uh, we see this in places that are, that where people aren't supposed to quote, unquote, eat wildlife, places like Kenya and Tanzania. There's a huge uh, rural, rural reliance on, on, on wildlife as a source of, of food and income. Of course, we've been eating, we've relied on wildlife since we were, a, since the dawn of our species. That's why we think our brains are as big as they are, is because we were able, we were good scavengers and all, all the rest. So um, it's not surprising that there are deep and ancient uh, ties, both cultural and, and others, to, to the consumption of wildlife, and it's widely used in traditional practices. Um, and it's a popular and a valuable source of meat for this, these rapidly growing urban populations. Okay, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that um, a little bit later. And then last, as we know, um, and there's of course some hysteria around it, but there's also some good facts around it, that the consumption of wildlife, this butchering, um, and the ex exposure that's created through these interactions with wildlife is a significant source of, of, of disease. So it's thought HIV uh, in, in many circles, started this way, monkeypox, Ebola, and other things as associated with, with wildlife consumption. So when we're talking about bushmeat, um, 
a lot of the work we do in, in markets, uh, in many markets around Africa and others, is focused on uh, things like these, uh, these antelope, these are cob in West Africa. Of course, primates are featured heavily, but it, uh, when we're talking about bushmeat, we're also talking about reptiles, birds, um, amphibians, um, uh, forest snails, caterpillars. These are all critical sources of protein, huge parts of commerce. Um, and things, again, as, as large as, as elephants, this is from, from uh, Cote d'Ivoire, um, and then bats, okay, fruit bats, everywhere bats, everywhere we work, bats are a major part of the bushmeat trade. And again, bats, uh, particularly fruit bats, offer the opportunity to harvest a lot of individuals in a short, short period of time. This is from Madagascar, and a, a former student of mine who's now in public health at Harvard, Chris Golden, um, but this is one of our sites in, in, in Madagascar. Oh. We're being Skyped. Okay. Um, anyway, so all of these things, uh, when we're, again, when we're talking about bushmeat, it's not one species. It's not even a small group of species. It's a vast array of, of, of species we're talking about. I mentioned the urban and rural, and one of the things we study is actually the differences in the, between ur urban and rural wildlife consumption and some of the economic and social correlates of wildlife use. And really what it comes down to, of course, is that for a while there were many people uh, working in rural areas saying uh, bushmeat is the safety net. You know, it's the when the crops fail, when, uh, when you have uh, no other options, um, you, go back, you go back to hunting and gathering. And so bushmeat is this critical safety net in times of drought. And our study is showing, you know, responses to drought, responses to flood, responses to HIV, responses to other epidemics shows that when people are knocked down, when rural communities are knocked down, not surprisingly, they go back to wildlife. So there's strong evidence this is a critical safety net, if you will, uh, for, for, for rural communities, um, some of whom living in poverty, dealing with the, 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 the you know, global failing of smallholder agriculture and the rest. But at the other, same time, others have, have been studying in urban areas and saying, wait, forget about the safety net, forget about this, you know, uh, the, you know the, the last food of, of, of the poor. Um, what, what they're seeing in a lot of urban areas are people paying more than they would for, for domestic meat to get the taste from the bush. As, as it's often called. So what we see are what are in many areas of West Africa called chop bars or other things in urban areas that where are restaurants that serve that serve bush meat. So we but uh, you know so for a while it was no it's this no it's this and of course as as often happens we've reached a point in the bush meat community if we can sadly call ourselves that where we we recognize of course it's both of these things and all of these things and the fact that there is this urban demand creates has actually changed the consumption dynamics. You have a little bit of a of a, almost a Lake Victoria, uh, uh, a Nile perch story, where now many people uh, would never eat something like this African buffalo in their community. Uh, that's too valuable to eat. They would sell it, right? It would be sold. But they would eat uh, smaller, smaller uh, ungulates and rodents and the rest. Yeah. Yeah. So it can be. I think. The, the evidence that's out there that, that, I've, that I've read is that it can be transmitted through all of those, but it's actually thought, if I were to go back to the first slide, it's thought that some of the ungulates and even perhaps the primates may get it by eating fruit that has droppings from fruit bats, if that makes sense. So it's still thought, even in those contexts, that the, the fruit bat is probably the reservoir. Um, but we know that dogs can carry uh, Ebola, I believe. Um, and, and many other, uh, diker ant antelope, um, and many primates. And so um, I think, uh, and, and I'm not, this is where I get into imposter zone, and I'll say that right away. But I'll, you know, my colleagues hopefully can comment on that. But my understanding is that there, there are many possible hosts, and that, um, and that is thought that transmission to humans has occurred through many different so sources of, of meat. Um, and that bush meat, as I'll talk about, is, I mean, uh, Ebola is also, from, from studies, has shown that even, you know, in a, in a carcass, um, can be, you know, viable for, you know, 15, 20 days um, from one of the studies I've read. So what's changed? I mean, really, uh, as Art mentioned, uh, I think the first Ebola outbreak was documented was in 1976. Um, but we know, I think we know, or we assume that it goes back a lot, a lot further than that. And, but there's, of course, been huge attention, not just on Ebola, but on other uh, zoonoses and, and their, their potential to, to create epidemics. Um, but, uh, and so as, a, as someone studying sort of both the ecological dimensions of this and some of the socioeconomic dimensions, um, we're often asking ourselves, is this just more of what's always been going on and we document it better and there's more people on the planet or are there really things that might be changing economically and socially that we need to pay attention to? 
So one of those, of course, is that uh, we know we have more consumers than ever before. Even as global you know, biodiversity declines, wildlife stocks decline, we know we have more people consuming bushmeat than we've ever had before on our, on our planet. And that we know that that consumption is in part because of the uh, people are needing to use that, that safety net. We know it's also because of this growing urban demand that's creating uh, a real increasing value in harvested wildlife. <laughs> We know that as these ecological communities, these wildlife communities are impacted, are heavily harvested, that they become depleted. We have a, a sense what's called in our oceans called fishing down the food chain, which is the, high, the largest bodied animals are removed first, and then we just keep fishing, and then we're all eating shrimp and sardines. Um, and it's a similar thing in many of these areas in West Africa, where the largest animals have been removed. So there's a shift in what people are consuming. When you ask someone, and we've done lots of this, you ask someone who's 50, 60, 70 year, years old what their favorite bush meats are, it'll be something that no longer occurs. It's often something like drill or, or, or other species. Uh, they'll say, now that's the, that's, the, that's the best meat out there. You ask a kid, it's always the things that are most common today, porcupine, grass cutter, which is a large rat, um, or, or, or in some cases, uh, small monkeys or other things. So we have a real shift in the type of species that are being eaten, and that's significant, from a, I think, from a disease perspective. And we have the poorer condition of harvested animals. So we have these synergies, these additive and synergistic effects uh, between forest clearing, between uh, climate shifts, um, and, and between um, again, you know, just alteration of habitat and, and increased interaction between, between people, our, our, our animals, our domesticated animals, and, and wildlife. Um, and so um, we know this, and we know this from studies, that, and this has been uh, hypothesized for fruit bats as well, and actually observed in fruit bats, that fruit, fruit bats living closer to human settlement uh, are generally car carry higher viral loads than, than fruit bats living in more pristine areas. Um, and what we hear from thousands of interviews of hunters across West Africa and Central Africa um, and parts of East Africa and Madagascar is that people are now in a position, in part because they're more often to sell meat than they are to eat it in their own households, they're, they're more often to actually take a dead animal on the ground or to actually hunt and take home an animal that is visibly sick. So of course that's not an intelligent thing to do when you're bringing meat back to your household. Um, but if you're if if you know that okay we're gonna we're gonna cook it we'll smoke it up it'll be fine and we'll send it to the capital and we'll make our money and it'll all be fine um, then maybe you feel a little bit differently about it and so it, it all you know ninety some percent of hunters said uh, reported and again these are thousands of interviews have reported that they 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 they, they have seen a change in the standards for what uh, what what will be hunted or what will be collected. Um, and then, of course, we have this really dramatic uh, expansion of rural to urban uh, trade networks, as well as international trade of bushmeat. And I'll talk a little bit about those. So I just wanted to show, this is a colleague of mine, Robert Tine, who's, I don't, we don't work in, in Liberia, but Ro Robert does. And Robert went to one bushmeat market in the capital, Monrovia. And um, he, yeah, so he went to uh, one market on one day and basically from that, tried to trace the or origination of every uh, primate and ungulate that was found in that one market, and there are dozens uh, in, in, in the city, uh, but uh, tried to trace the, the source. And here's what he came up with. This is one day for, for primates and, and ungulates. Um, and I've drawn, you know, I just did these little bad PowerPoint squiggles. But if we actually knew the route by which these animals came from a forest to the capital, it would be this incredibly convoluted process down dirt roads to uh, sm smaller towns, that, you know, to other, to, other, to other roads, to other towns. Um, and we would see that you know, in a single day, you have animals coming to the capital from, from all over, um, including areas that we associate with, I think, the, the, um, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the ground uh, uh, or what, I'm bringing the, the word point zero or whatever for uh, for um, for e for this particular uh, e Ebola outbreak. Um, about ten years ago, I had uh, through a very random taxi ride with a Ghanaian who, it turned out, I knew his fam his, some of his family members. So this is ten years ago. Um, through this interaction, we started a volunteer network that's now over 300, primarily taxi drivers uh, around the world, primarily in North America and Europe. And what we've been doing for the last 10 years is monitoring the movement of, of wildlife coming out of Africa into Europe and North American cities. And so I just cherry-picked 
um, a, a small amount of our results. So we, we monitor in 41 cities, um, just in Europe and North America, and, and in another 30, uh, uh, 37 in Sub-Saharan Africa. But I just cherry-picked a subset from five capitals, from my five major cities in West Africa. And I also cherry-picked from a subset of, of wildlife where we have marked the animals uh, prior to their leaving the, 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 their, their, point, their port of, of, of shipping, okay? So we've marked the animals and then our, our volunteers in, in the US and Europe identify that they've seen the mark. Okay, so I've just taken, we have about 3,000 animals for which that's the case. I've just pulled together last night 174 from these five cities just to show you the movement of wildlife um, across, of African wildlife across the country. Okay, so this is, when I talk about the internationalization, uh, we've, we've now documented over 100,000 as we go and, and, and do counts in these markets, and more than 100,000 individual um, animals, but this is again from a subset of animals that are actually marked and followed as they move around our planet. Uh, I won't spend time, this is just a little bit if you're interested, by, by city, rodents, ungulates, primates, other, it's a big mix. The size of the pies is, a, is a, the size, the relative size of the markets in different cities. Anyway, so um, just going back to this, I've taken longer than I wanted to or should have, um, but uh, you know, as, a, as an ecologist and coming as a wildlife researcher, I'm always trying to emphasize the, you know, how important it is to have someone like me at the public health table. Um, you can imagine. Uh, this is actually a case where uh, I think the emphasis on the bushmeat trade has been misplaced. Um, and it's been misplaced because it's not something you turn on and off. It's the equivalent of, you know, for swine flu or avian flu saying, okay, world, shut down pig consumption and chicken consumption. We're going to let this thing pass. Um, and that's not going to happen. And we have far more alternatives than the folks who are relying on bushmeat do. So where is there a role? Well, there's a role for hunter, for those who are handling and, hunt, and hunting wildlife, just through education. Again, you're not going to cut off this reliance on wildlife from people unless you've got um, you know, in uh, the, the means to radically change uh, livelihood opportunities for, for a billion people. Um, but where the re emphasis really needs to be, and, and I think this is, again, just saying, I guess, you know, maybe the ecologist doesn't, the wildlife ecologist doesn't get a place at the table, and that's okay in this, in this sense, is of course the emphasis needs to be on this early identification, treatment, and, uh, and isolation. Um, and so, you know, I think understanding bushmeat, understanding that relationship is critically important. Hopefully this context is, uh, is somewhat valuable to you, um, but at the same time, you know, the next time you read something in one of these major uh, journals or, or or publications that says, you know, w w uh, we need to sort of have a policy, you know, for for uh, ceasing the the, the wish me trade is, you know, please recognize that um, that is not only culturally blind; it's 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 not going to be effective in dealing with these types of type of issues. So thanks. Thank you very much, Justin. That's a really very interesting and much needed, uh, <coughs> essentially backdrop that many of us should know more about. <laughs> and, and, and it actually makes a lot of sense in everything you say. It's just that we don't actually have the facts to, to, be, you know, to, to fill it up. But I think that that's incredibly important. And of course, you didn't really go into the whole economic aspects of things too, which is you know, driving this as well. Um, and I, I think that um, Marina is going to talk about this more, assuming we can connect. So um, <coughs> we are attempting this new, this, uh, this should work. We all use Skype all the time. It's just that whenever we actually need it, it always crashes. <laughs> but we're going to hope that this actually works. And so the idea here was to um, bring um, another perspective. And like I said, then we're going to have a conversation among the panelists and then open it up. Um, but uh, Maureen Ferrum is an associate professor of anthropology at Berkeley. Um, and has long focused her research on West Africa, especially in Sierra Leone. Um, and her work has explored the sociocultural and symbolic aspects of civil war and conflict within this region. And so she is actually now currently in Holland. Um, actually, I understand was also going to be doing work in Sierra Leone, but be because of the, the situation was had to actually <laughs> retreat to, to Holland. And uh, we're very happy to have her joining us. Um, due to the outbreak, she's refocused her efforts uh, currently to examine social pathways associated with Ebola spread 
and its implications for efforts to contain and stop the outbreak. And so she's now um, going to join us from Holland and assume that we have sound once I shut up. <laughs> and um, we're welcome. Maureen, thank you very much for coming to our symposium. Um, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Good. Uh, I'm very sorry to say that I missed most of the rest of the presentation, so um, um, I hope uh, what I say will not um, go at cross purposes, though I didn't miss the wonderful um, pathways that um, Justin traced for uh, bushmeat, which um, sound very familiar to um, my experiences with Sierra Leonean um, expatriates. Um, I'm not an expert on Ebola, but um, as was stated, was about to leave for Sierra Leone on my sabbatical when all this happened. And with my colleagues here in the Netherlands and in Sierra Leone, with whom I was supposed to collaborate on my um, research this year, we have sort of cumulatively analyzed our data from the past three decades to see ways in which we could contribute to the conversations um, and policy interventions um, currently uh, in this epidemic. Um, there is a case to be made for a regional approach to, um, to this uh, crisis. So to the question, why now, why here, um, uh, the most uh, recent um, historical connections and, and rationale for the regional approach has to do with the shared civil war that moved over the poorest borders um, in this region and um, the ethnicities, languages, and the resulting uh, damaged health infrastructure from the civil war. Um, of special note um, in this region is this Kissy Triangle, uh, so-called, um, the parrot-speak region of Guinea, which inserts itself. Do you, do you want to share your screen, Marianne? Share your screen. Share your share your screen for your slides. Let's, let's just keep going. Okay. You, you can see my slides, though, now? Yeah. Good. Um, okay, so I was pointing with my cursor to the Paris Peak region here, where Guinea um, meets, um, inserts itself between Sierra Leone and Liberia, which is um, inhabited mostly across the three borders by the ethnic group named Kissy in Sierra Leone that takes on different names in the different um, countries. But they have been probably the single most impacted ethnicity by this uh, epidemic since they do inhabit this whole um, region straddling the um, three countries. But the more important commonality is the weakened infrastructure, health infrastructure from the Civil War. Um, in fact, some social scientists are arguing that the epidemic is in fact the result of global health initiatives over the past two decades, many of them financed by private philanthropies in the name of global health security with an emphasis on security. Um, centered on public-private partnerships um, in which technology and communication innovations were supposed to offer simple solutions for pandemic preparedness. The problem, as um, Eva pointed out earlier, is that this approach has shifted attention away from very run down, especially in the aftermath of war, um, clinics um, and healthcare infrastructures where electricity, basic drugs, supplies were completely lacking. And these were the kinds of structures and are the kinds of structures where for many Africans still, um, is the place where um, healthcare can be a sought and trained nurses and doctors can offer it. Um, so just to give you a sense um, of how it's 
it's here at the end. I'm sorry, I cannot advance my slides um, for some reason. My screen is frozen. So I'm going to have to um, quickly do something to. Can you press escape? Yes, and nothing's happening. Okay. Um, it's not me. That's there we go. Working. So, um, just to give you um, a sense of public health care expenditure as percentage of GDP in Sierra Leone, here you have Sierra Leone, the blue line. The red line is Sub-Saharan um, Africa. You see the peak with the um, international intervention um, to end the civil war in 2000 and the immediate um, following um, years, and the quite dramatic decrease um, since then, as um, intervention in this field has been pushed off onto private um, entities, NGOs, external um, actors, and so on. Um, um, in, in the same period, if you take, for example, the period straddling the end of the war between 1999 and um, 2004, the net aid received um, by Sierra Leone has um, dramatically um, increased. And um, uh, then again, uh, decreased. Um, so even though regional case for intervention um, could and should uh, be made, uh, there's been an interesting balkanization in the way in which um, international um, actors have intervened uh, that have really pretty much shadowed colonial and Cold War alliances. So the French have gone to Guinea, the Americans are intervening heavily in Liberia, and the British in Sierra Leone. Um, what's more, the intervention has also taken um, some pretty militarized um, uh, aspects, not just because of the intervention of the armies from these countries um, or various branches of the military uh, in the epidemic, but also within the various countries, the governments themselves have imposed draconian uh, checkpoints, uh, quarantining entire districts in um, Sierra Leone, declaring in September, uh, for instance, a three-day shutdown where everyone had to be home and there were home-to-home -home visits to look for uh, concealed um, sick or bodies um, in Sierra Leone. The same was done in Liberia for certain neighborhoods, um, including the West Point neighborhood in uh, Monrovia. Um, so again, the emphasis on security and military style interventions was quite um, heavy-handed with some pretty uh, uh, dramatic uh, consequences in terms of underreporting and hiding by the population from public health um, authorities. Um, another major difference uh, has to do not just with the colonial histories of these countries, um, but uh, with, with resulting um, uh, corollaries of states and religions, which um, are tense uh, for this, these border regions with the central state in all cases, but for different reasons. I mean, in Guinea, the populations in the forest region where the epidemic first hit uh, had long been um, at loggerheads with a Muslim-dominated political establishment um, and um, that had been uh, quite iconoclastic and um, destructive of everything from religious practices uh, to um, local languages um, and um, associational um, forms. Uh, in Liberia, there's a well-known domination by American Liberian settlers who basically occupied the coastal strip of 40 miles of coastal strip of the country um, and have been uh, really controlling the wealth and politics of the country for um, the better part of the 19th and 20th century into the present. Um, and there were also very different um, government responses to the epidemic. For instance, I think a major factor in the big gap between suspected cases and actual uh, presences in public health structures in Liberia at the moment um, is uh, in 
great part uh, probably due to the un, um, um, to the very uh, unusual decision by its government to cremate uh, bodies. In Sierra Leone, there's been major state disinvestment in health care structures too, but in the last decade or so, things had started turning around, and the messages, the public health messages, are actually catching on um, in Sierra Leone um, quite well, even though at the moment that's where um, the highest um, rates of infection seem to be at the, uh, um, in, right now. Um, the problem and one of the areas in which in my uh, discipline has tried to uh, intervene and other social scientists as well has been in trying to help policy um, makers and people intervening in this crisis um, in a situation of changing um, uh, knowledge base, really, because even medicinal and scientific research is changing um, and moving in leaps and bounds fairly rapidly, and that leads to sometimes conflicting or confusing messages. And I have a few up here um, on the uh, on the slide for you, and we can talk more about them later. But just to give you again to return to Justin's um, uh, theme of Bushby, um, he is an example of really slow response that ended up creating more confusion. Um, as recently as August, uh, when already uh, medical scientists were, um, were demonstrating that most of the cont contagion was happening human to human, uh, the government passed these bylaws for the prevention of, of Ebola that focused heavily on sanctions, fines, imprisonment for the consumption, sale, and circulation of bushmeat. Um, um, and, and until a survey conducted last um, month in Sierra Leone found that even though people generally were aware and believing of the disease, 80% of them in this small rural area thought, still thought that um, it came from consuming both bushmeat. Um, so in this article that I've um, jointly um, um, co-authored and um, posted on the site of um, PLOS, Neglected Tropical Diseases, uh, with my colleagues here in the Netherlands and in Sierra Leone, um, we examined what we call this pendulum effect in flare-outs of the disease, which we think needs to be addressed and is not fully addressed with the um, a, a predominantly urban focus on um, this disease because um, the pattern seems to be that there'll be flare-ups in urban areas uh, and then in widely disparate and disconnected rural areas and um, I hope to show some of the zigzagging connections um, in a few minutes um, that uh, Justin was referring to um, in relation to uh, population mobility. This is a part of Africa where, unlike the Sudan and DRC, where earlier outbreaks happened, uh, there is tremendous amounts of population mobility and um, population densities in some areas. Um, so I will focus on the Fongo Mayamba Junction case, but a very recent um, reporting, re similar case um, two days ago emerged in um, Liberia, where a village of 300 inhabitants off a motorable road in a, a walk-in village lost 10% of its um, inhabitants um, in a little more than a month. Um, so let me quickly go to this case. It involves the village of, of Fogbo, of, of some 500 people, a walk-in village. The closest large market town is Moyamba Junction um, on uh, the two, the confluence of two, the two only basically paved roads um, in, in Sierra Leone connecting the, the capital city to the interior. And here's, here's how this, um, this uh, uh, outbreak uh, moved. Uh, there was a funeral in Daru where a little boy whose father was originally from Fogbu, this is the area of Fogbu, um, um, the boy was sent to the funeral of a relative, um, got 
got sick there, was sent to hospital in Kenema, which is one of the major um, centers currently set up for uh, testing and um, uh, dealing with Ebola cases. Uh, his father visited him there while sick. The boy died. The father was supposed to be quarantined because testing has shown that the boy had uh, Ebola, but he got away at night um, and went back to his hometown, uh, Kobu, where his sister took care of him. His sister happened to be an elder of the Women's um, Sunday Society, so a very senior role healer and uh, elder of the community. The man uh, died, but at that point nobody in Fogbo knew or thought that uh, this was due to Ebola. His, when his sister got sick though, the chief realized that this must have been Ebola and called public health authorities who came and, um, and no, who said that um, they had to leave the body unburied and they would come and uh, take care of it. The other women, um, elders of the society, refused to let the body be and uh, insisted on washing and burying it. That started a chain of, uh, of infections that affected several surrounding villages in Fongbo and eventually uh, went all the way to Moyamba Junction, where a pharmacist took care of one of the women, uh, the sister of the town chief, in fact, who later died herself. Um, the pharmacist himself uh, uh, was infected, and through him, several uh, patients um, of his. Um, so by the end of September, there were uh, about two dozen uh, mortalities that could be directly connected to this. And eventually the whole of Moyamba Junction, which was a bustling big market town, was completely abandoned. Um, and cases started spreading to an even bigger market center um, further uh, north of this location. Uh, so, typical pattern of this outbreak, public health, uh, I mean, health workers being on the front lines. And here, from our article, are three different pattern names of rural mobilities in seven neighboring chiefdoms six randomly picked villages in those chiefdoms with the larger center of Kenema, but also, as you can see, among these villages and outside of the district for various reasons, for marriage, for schooling, and for work. And this gives you a sense of how complicated the patterns and networks of human mobility for different reasons, and we plotted it from these kinds of movements from many other kinds of activities. Um, uh, so, um, here are some of the resources that um, anthropologists both in the United States and in um, Europe have put together. And anthropologists who are at this moment in the field in those three countries are posting field notes and insights about the epidemic. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Again, a really wonderful backdrop for, for what is going on and uh, with, with the data that not many of us have access to. So I think that that's a really wonderful other aspect and we see from the ecological point of view and then from the human mobility and cultural aspects that really fills in a lot of what we don't hear in the news. I think that is really, really wonderful. What we're going to try and do now is, um, I think we're going to set up the, some chairs and we'll have the panelists come to the front. Um, and Marina is still going to be projected at part of this, and then um, I'm going to lead the discussion with a couple questions among the panelists, um, to some to all of them, some to some individual, and then we're going to open it up for questions um, so that we can have a full conversation. So I think we just. Yeah. For those who were here yesterday, there was an enormous set of sofas, which looked really comfortable, but looked really heavy. <laughs> so we decided to go with these uncomfortable, but <laughs> very lightweight chairs. <laughs> so um, I think, and we'll, why don't we have some questions for, while we're waiting for Maureen to rejoin us. She's okay. she's she's still, oh, she's here still. Excellent. Um, so I think that I would start with saying, um, 
Well, there's so many different aspects to, to address, but um, one of them that just gets back to how, that does talk about the, the health impacts, for instance, in terms of how you think this, out, we've been focused very much on the Ebola outbreak, but given that the whole public health infrastructure is involved, how does this outbreak um, affect other diseases? I mean, it's not like malaria and pregnant you know, issues stopped when Ebola came along. And this, you know, well, I think yeah. as, as everyone who reads the paper knows, there have been enormous knock-on effects. So first of all, many people will not go to healthcare facilities uh, out of concern about getting Ebola there. Uh, and secondly, many healthcare facilities simply are not functioning anymore. So delivery of a baby, uh, treatment of malaria, uh, all of these routine things, some of which are life or death problems, uh, are not getting sufficient attention simply because of the enormous effects on the health, the, the minimal healthcare system that was there and people's willingness or ability to access the system. So I think the general sense has been an enormous impact on, on uh, health outcomes from a variety of other things, but we really don't have any data. Yeah, and, I mean, and going forward, I mean, and also I wonder, um, and Marion, this may be for, for you for understanding what the, what's going on in terms of both the communication, communication to and the response from the, the local populations. I mean, we, when we start seeing the curves, the epidemic curves start coming down, is that real? Is that, or you know, is your sense that it's the, you know, from because of the issues with trust or because of the issues um, with the lack of burial teams being accessible as fast as they should be, et cetera, um, you know, are they just not reporting and not coming to health centers, or do you think it's really is turning the corner in some of the some of the areas? Are you asking me yeah. question? Yeah. Um, so I, I do think that underreporting is a major problem in Liberia, and they say parts of Guinea right now. Um, I, I think a big missed opportunity here was to actually consult and enlist the knowledge of, of people most affected by this epidemic. Uh, one of the things that um, within historical memory of these regions um, um, could have been uh, leveraged is the fact that they had developed at the community level isolating mechanisms for mm -hmm. contagious diseases um, within their living memory, smallpox, leprosy, and so on. Um, and having missed the opportunity to um, to use um, communities to get them involved um, like this, they did set up um, some fairly confrontational relations that are now um, uh, being gradually um, superseded because the, the sheer reality, I mean, a village of 300 people that in a month loses 30 um, of its inhabitants, uh, these kinds of events are traumatic. And, and people, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult to deny Ebola, but there are still um, people who are. Um, so I, I don't, the problem is that some of these flare-ups are happening in communities that are um, on, on, on tracks, basically, that are away from um, uh, hospitals, from, the, from motorable roads, and so on. So usually the, the information about it trickles through uh, with a bit of a time lag. So I'm really not sure what the answer to that question is right now, because just as people are saying, oh yes, it's under control, you have a, you know, a flare up happening. You have Mali two days ago with the imam dying and all of a sudden now they're scrambling for context, you know, tracing all over again in Mali. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much, Marina. And, and Art, I don't know if you want to I don't add think anyone that. knows. I yeah. don't think anyone knows how many undiagnosed cases are out there in, in various areas. Uh, and so what the true burden is uh, still remains to be determined. And, uh, yeah. Okay. I'm just going to repeat that question because I think we're being 
uh, um, taped. And so th when you ask questions, to so use the mic, but the point was just that there's, um, you know, that there's a two or 2.5 cases per infected person in the models, but that in fact there's a very wide range between uh, it seems the super infected or not. And it may be Miriam and also Art can answer that. So you're referring to the reproductive number, which is thought to be in the range of about two. Um, but one of the things, one of actually a former student of both ESPRM and public health, a guy named Steve Bellin at the University of Texas, just pointed out in a, pay, in a, in a letter to Lancet, uh, is that unless you take into account asymptomatic infections, it's really very difficult to know what to do with these models. And we don't have a very good handle on what proportion of infections are asymptomatic. So I think the idea that the number is about two, uh, you know, I would take that with a large grain of salt in terms of exactly what the, the R naught uh, for Ebola is, particularly in this, uh, in this particular outbreak. So, so I, the assumption at this point is that there are probably a number of asymptomatic infections, a number of subclinical infections, uh, but again, the research is virtually lacking at the moment. So, so that's, a, that's a really good point that uh, it's sort of unaccounted for in the models. And, uh, but in terms of the, uh, the number, average number of people that are infected, even accounting for those effects, is it going to be highly variable uh, in reality, like going from anywhere of 10, 20 per person in some cases, or you know, zero in other cases? Or is it uh, within some tight band of you know, three or four um, on average? I mean, is there some way to sort of, I mean, well, I think the evidence would suggest that at least in the healthcare setting, in terms of people who have direct contact with an ill individual, that there is enormous variability in how many people are going to end up being infected. It in part relates to what precautions people are able to take or know to take. On the one hand, it probably relates in part to the viral no, number of viral particles per, per milliliter of blood uh, or, or secretions in, in some of these patients at the time they're being cared for. But my guess is there actually is a fair bit of variation. I was just, Maureen, you sounded like you had some answers there. Can I just say, in terms of human behavior, there are such things as kind of super infectious events, and the death of a very senior member of a ritual society whose burial and body preparation requires particular forms of handling are considered such kinds of super events. On the other hand, there are actually, in some parts of Sierra Leone cultural, proscriptions against very, uh, uh, too much attention being given to the mourning of children. So while very, very young children who die are barely touched, and they're certainly not washed before burying, very senior elders of the secret societies are surrounded by cadres of members of their cohort, and therefore, the rates of infections at those kinds of events were definitely much higher. Thank you. And I, that kind of leads to a question for both you, Maureen, and then also for Justin, in terms of, um, I mean, these are ancient practices, and this is one event that's very traumatic and has a lot of media attention. But, you know, you can't, for instance, as Justin said, you can't just say, oh, well, stop, bush me, period, Fox News said it, and that's the answer. You know, I mean, like, <laughs> of course not. And similarly, you know, recognition of burial practices, I mean, there's a lot of talk about this, but it is, you know, there's cultural traditions and, you know, and on the ground, I mean, what, we, I don't think we have a good sense of what it's being perceived, you know, the messages and also the clash with the culture, and how is that being played out? Uh, that would be to you, Maureen. Um, well, one thing I wanted to, I would like to, uh, one point I'd like to make is that while people are quite attached to their cultural practices and, and history, they're also incredibly resourceful and responsive to un, unprecedented crises. And there are already in place, even in culturally acceptable forms, alternatives to certain practices. During the war, for instance, there weren't initiations held because it was insecure. So, you know, supposed cultural hard and fast rules about pu puberty being the age when initiation ha happens were all of a sudden set aside and all kinds of accommodations and flexibility was introduced in the system. Similarly, there are provisions for not celebrating funerals under certain circumstances. Um, and uh, certainly, once the um, people's um, uh, uh, cooperation was enlisted, 
Uh, there are examples of communities where they've taken alternative uh, approaches. Fake funerals are apparently a, 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 a kind of quite an established practice in Liberia when families don't have the money to perform the actual uh, funeral. They bury the person and then hold the whole ceremony when they can afford it later with no body. Um, the one, uh, you know, but, but in Liberia, when you have a government that comes in and cremates bodies, which goes against, you know, just in, in quite dramatic ways, anything that um, local people would have conceived as alternatives, that's when you start um, having trouble. So I, I have no doubt that people can come to alternative solutions as long as they're consulted and in producing some kind of solution rather than being told by the governments. Right, and back to the theme of on the ground and an autochthonous response. But I, I think also one of the, uh, that you mentioned in terms of the conflicting, both public health messages and also realities. I mean, because it, it seems from the outside, like, oh yes, a burial team, and, and there's a lot of talk about dignified and safe burials. And yet, you know, you were talking on the phone a couple days ago, you mentioned that, it, you know, there's three weeks sometimes it takes for the burial team to come. And that not only is, you know, very difficult for the, but it's also a huge public health problem in and of itself. And so, you know, there's not only, a, I think, a, here a conflict in terms of the messaging, but also in terms of the reality of the public health response just because of the, the whole situation. So, I mean, and maybe you can speak to that. Right, this, was, this happened in the Kenema district, which along with Kailan, the two, the two border districts in Sierra Leone, was seeing hundreds of, of cases of suspected um, infection and then saw hundreds of mortality, of, of, of fatalities from Ebola. And there was one burial team who traveled the whole district. Um, uh, I, I mean, the situation now is gradually uh, catching up and it's changing. But for a while, it was just a simple question of math. There was no way they could actually deliver the promises that they were making. Uh, equally, they were giving this uh, toll-free phone number for people to call to report Ebola cases, and they simply did not have the staffing to answer the call, so nobody was answering the number that you were supposed to call to report suspected Ebola deaths and body uh, pickup requests and so on and so forth. So, I mean, it just needed scaling up so rapidly by the time people, you know, the authorities realized what they were dealing with, that there simply wasn't time to develop that kind of capacity given the situation on the ground in the country at the time. I think these things are now becoming less of a problem. Um, you know, usually by the night of a reported death, um, the body has, someone has come, especially in urban areas, well, certainly in urban areas, the body has been uh, recovered. And otherwise, people do know not to, bod not to wash bodies and to just wrap them and bury them with as little contact as they can. Great, thank you. And again, the complexity I think that we're getting from all of these talks about what's actually behind. And and to you, Justin, just I mean, it, coming out of this and understanding, is it what what do you see as either the way forward and also potentially the future and say the bushmeat and sure. um, trade and also the ecology and and the economy of of local. Right. Yeah. Well, I think I mean one of the areas of study that I mean I, I think several folks have tried to look at. Uh, how consumer per perceptions of bushmeat have changed as a result of this Ebola outbreak. And, um, but I mean, conservation groups have used disease risk for a, a while as, as a, as a uh, you know, sort of getting it out there in the communities to try and um, deter wildlife consumption. And I think, you know, for the most part, I think, you know, some of the results from uh, looking at uh, particularly uh, Liberia is that the bushmeat, I mean, the Ebola outbreak has impacted consumers in, in urban areas, certainly more than rural areas. That makes sense in part because rural, you know, consumers in rural areas have fewer al alternatives. Mm -hmm. I think there have been some shifts in what folks in rural areas, what species they're consuming and other things. But I think, as Marianne touched on, there's such a deep history of, of conflict between centralized governments and many of these communities anyway that what we see and, and is that communities that haven't been directly affected by this outbreak or, or other outbreaks are very quick to see a lot of this as part of a gov central government effort to control their lives, and you know, this, this happens in, in our own country. Um, but, um, but I think, you know, and so that's, 
there's, it's obviously very loaded. And I think, you know, this, the idea of these health crews coming from, from big cities and burning, you know, and burning people before they can be buried, you can imagine that's very culturally loaded. So I think, I mean, as far as, as moving forward, um, you know, I don't, I, you know, we're going to continue, I think, to see a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, issues around um, diseases emerging through, through bushmeat. And that's for all the reasons I mentioned. It doesn't, though the wildlife stocks are depleted in many of these areas, it has generally meant that people are working harder to find what's yeah. left and are, and again, are hunting or maybe consuming things that they didn't used to consume at, um, at the same rates. And so, you know, I, I think in the, lo in, in the long term, there is, there has to be some sort of, you know, coordinated effort uh, that is focused. And this is where, you know, our conversations with, with big development groups and other things is about um, whether it's trying to come up with sustainable livestock production or mm -hmm. trying to come up with alternative livelihood programs in many of these areas so that there isn't the same kind of reliance on necessarily on wildlife. And we do that not only for the human health uh, re human health reasons, but also for, for biodiversity conservation reasons. Is, um, you know, that has many parallels where big international NGOs have come in and said, stop, stop killing things. And that, you know, that's not the strategy. Right, I mean, it just seems like there's a lot of economic underneath this that no one's really touching on. Because, I mean, you have to have something else. I mean, in fact, right. It, you know, if that's the livelihood, not yeah. only for eating, but now because of it actually is a cash crop, if you wish, you know, then yeah. not selling to the urban is going to make these even more stressed in terms of the rules. I mean, are there programs that are underway for alternative economic yeah, livelihoods there, and there's, whatnot? Yeah, there's... You hope now even yeah. more, but you don't really hear yeah. about that. There's many, there are many of them. Fewer have gone in explicitly to look at how it changes hunting behavior, but there's, we're starting to see, we're, we're part of some of those, mm -hmm. sort of says, you know, dealing with uh, so Newcastle's disease in chickens. If you can go and actually vaccinate chickens, you can alter, you know, you can dramatically increase chicken production. What does that mean for, for hunting? And it has a really a positive effect in reducing hunting by increasing chicken production. That's pretty, pr uh, pretty straightforward. Um, but there's also, yeah, but there's also, it's also an immense, an immense challenge. So it's not, it's going to be done uh, or worked on piecemeal. I yeah. Think. Well, that actually brings up two points that I want to make. I think maybe those last two and then we'll open the floor. But um, I, the, you mentioned the vaccinating of animals and I wanted to talk to Art about also. So my question is essentially, I mean, a lot of this has been around infection response in terms of uh, can, just in being able to have the proper PPE and not get in, infected when you take it off and, you know, et cetera. So that a lot of it has just been how to keep from being infected at the healthcare le worker level. And, you know, gradually I think that's improving, but then of course there's an entire other response would be like if you were vaccinated or if there are drugs available, but that's, you know, earlier in the pipeline that's getting there. But how do you see this playing out um, even if the accelerated vaccines, et cetera, even if they work? I mean, do you see this having an effect in this epidemic? How do you see it affecting future outbreaks say specifically for Ebola in your case, and then also how does that reflect into the animal population? So I think if you talk about vaccinating animals, uh, wild animals, the only programs I know of that are vaguely comparable have to do with trying to use bait to vaccinate uh, animals against rabies in this country. And I know of absolutely no success doing that in the African context. So rabies continues to be a substantial problem uh, mm -hmm. in, in Africa. So the idea you could vaccinate wild animals uh, maybe Justin knows how you would do that, but I think <laughs> that's far-fetched, would be my understanding. In terms of, of a human vaccine, I think we will have human vaccines that have efficacy and, and that are safe, uh, and that they will have them in, in large numbers of doses w within the next six to 12 months. I think then the interesting question will be what we do with them. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, sh short term, giving them to healthcare workers is obviously makes sense, but beyond that, mm -hmm. uh, how do we use them in children, uh, in adults, in rural areas, who, who you would target with, a, with an Ebola vaccine on a regular basis once the outbreak is over, I think is a really interesting policy question. Yeah, and of course the economics will come play into that too. Um, and maybe to, to Marine, um, in terms of that, I mean, I, I generally you think as with everything that the poor are the heaviest hit, but um, in terms of actual data are really seeing this play out. How, how has it, the effect been across social strata in the different countries? Um, well, the fact is that, that healthcare workers mm -hmm. are so disproportionately affected um, by it means that it's a fairly well-educated 
professional yeah. group in urban areas, at least, where you're talking about biomedical structures. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, obviously, in a lot of healers, traditional healers, have also been affected because in a medical pluralistic uh, environment, mm -hmm. as these countries have, um, all sorts of healing solutions are, um, are, are sought. Um, so, having said that, there certainly was a perception on the ground when talk started to come about around of, of experimental drugs um, and the selectivity with which those drugs were targeted first to, um, well, foreigners um, and then to very select um, um, affected people locally made gave the um, impression that even though um, the disease could hit right across the socioeconomic spectrum and did, and in fact some of the mm -hmm. most notorious early cases were quite cosmopolitan individuals like the Liberian um, diplomat who died in Nigeria um, and who had a home in the United States, um, that the, the, the great majority of people who were really dying quite horrible deaths were the very poor because mm -hmm. People further up the, the food chain had other ways, had, had better access earlier on to um, palliative and supportive care that gave them a better chance to survive. Yes, thank you. Um, and I think as a last question, just um, any final comments on, you know, how can we make sure once this crisis is over that the this is this massive intervention, which is as successful as it is so far, and hopefully more in the future, can be maintained or something positive can come out of this in the long run. Um, any comments from all Maybe of you? the audience has answers to that question. You know, well, I'll open it to them, too. <laughs> <laughs> I think, do you have any final words around that topic? Well, I think rebuilding infrastructure in these areas, the medical infrastructure, other types of infrastructure, is just a, a many-year enormous project. Uh, and what types of help and from whom and how it should be done is way beyond my pay grade, but it's a big challenge. Yeah, it seems like, I mean, just from the, the, the Zunosis background, I mean, there's obviously a great deal of money now through, you know, USAID Predict and other things looking into viral forecasting, but but it does seem like if this is just another case, you know, uh, Marianne's showing those charts of investment, if this is, and it likely will be, another blip of, of investment followed by um, a, a big drop, then as, as I was saying, I don't, you know, I don't see how this, this, uh, I mean, there, maybe there are things, there are lessons learned and uh, that, you know, that will benefit the response to future, um, future outbreaks. But I think unless that infrastructure is, is significantly addressed, then I, I don't see, you know, preventing this in the future. And then? Uh, I hope that the silver lining of this um, horrible outbreak is going to be some kind of strengthening of the public health infrastructure and particularly decentralized um, community care units that have been uh, set up not just at the chiefdom level but at the chiefdom section level um, because uh, I mean every time I go back to Sierra Leone I devote a portion of my time accompanying people to hospitals and to have to even go out and buy the sutures that a surgeon has to use to sew up a wound at an external pharmacy and bring it into the hospital because nothing else can be uh, uh, done there is just quite extraordinary. Sorry. Um, Unfortunately, um, it's quite ordinary. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to open now to the to questions from the floor. Claire, um, can you come up to the? Yeah, we need oh. to have you on the mic. No, that's okay. Uh, thank you to the panelists. This was really interesting and informative from different perspectives. I have a couple of questions, one for Justin and one for Art. The first one is I'm curious about how Ebola first showed up in West Africa in the first place. And I'm wondering if there's something that could be said about either the ecology of the fruit or the movement of the bats that could lend insight into that. And the other question is for Art. Is there any evidence of co-infection either exacerbating um, exacerbating illness of Ebola and or is there anything that can be said about um, is there any other disease that has Ebola like symptoms that Ebola might be confused with right now and I ask about that just in terms of numbers you know the unconfirmed cases how many of those are likely Ebola 
Sure. So, so first of all, I think everyone knows that certainly many of the manifestations of Ebola look just like malaria uh, and can look like a number of other illnesses. And in addition, West Africa, loss of fever uh, is, is certainly another uh, potential culprit, if you will. So if you don't have good diagnostic tests uh, in, in confirming, uh, you certainly can't be sure that everyone who's alleged to have Ebola has Ebola. There certainly could be other illnesses. In terms of co-infection, I see George Rutherford has left. George might have known more than I do, but I know of no studies looking at HIV or other co-infections as things, but, uh, but I think the evidence is pretty good from earlier outbreaks that the 70 to 90 percent mortality is primarily a function of total lack of care um, and a really bad virus, and I don't think you need co-infection uh, or the co-infection necessarily makes it a lot worse, but it could. And before Justin answers around the issue of Ebola in West Africa, all I would say is there are people who purport that there are studies, serologic studies, showing that some proportion of West African populations have been, do have antibodies to Ebola without a history of having had an Ebola-like illness. Now, are they from exposure to Ebola, from a cross-reacting virus to something totally else? Is it all a mistake? Uh, I, I don't know, but there are some suggestions that Ebola has been present in West Africa before. Uh, yeah, so I'm, 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 I think Art answered that well and, and probably knows more than I do on the, even on the, on the ecology of Ebola. But I do think, I mean, you look, you look at outbreaks over time, it, it fits quite well with the sort of, you know, uh, human forest zone. I think um, it's known that Ebola outbreaks do, do have a clear phenology associated with, very tightly uh, tied to the phenology of, of fruit. You know, so we do, you do have fruiting seasons associated with, and also um, changes in humidity associated with, with rain. So you, you, you can, I mean, with Ebola and, and I think, and other diseases, you can kind of have, have periods of, of high, of where you can predict there'll be great vulnerability. Well, Justin, I guess a related question is how far afield do bats go? How far oh, do, yeah. do primates travel? I have no yeah. idea. Do they travel hundreds of miles like birds or do they? Do sure. They yeah, well, they certainly can. So they'll, you know, they'll stay in areas as, as, you know, forming these big groups, they need they'll feed on mass and they'll cover great distances to find, you know, uh, where, where there's mass fruiting. Um, so there's great potential for for the disease to move, uh, or that that reservoir to move huge distances. I think, um, you know, I just want to touch on the resistance thing because I mentioned we had a phone call early in the week, and that's something from our hunter networks that we interview. I mean, many of them, and it also relates to the issue of class that they've said. What we hear a lot in, in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, at least in the work we're doing, is they, when, we, when they, we ask them to, or they reflect on what's going on with Ebola, is they say, yeah, those are, must be mostly urban people because we're, you know, we're, we have resistance to that. We, we, we don't get that. And I don't know, there's been a study, you know, there certainly have been people in, in you know, in, in, in those areas who have obviously have had Ebola. So, and, and I don't know if anyone here knows the work of Nathan Wolf, but Nathan Wolf and his viral forecasting group certainly looks at hunters throughout this area and does antibody studies. I have no idea what the prevalence of Ebola antibodies in these hunters is, but but yeah. I don't know if they're immune. But it doesn't it doesn't sound like it's new to follow up. Just talking, getting oral histories. It doesn't you know they they people feel like they know what this is and they've seen it before and they know stories of it um, and smaller outbreaks and other things. Um, but you know why? Why West Africa now? You know, well certainly, and there there are folks there are folks who say just follow the fruit bats, and you can predict and the timing of the year, and you can predict outbreaks. Um, and when you look at you know where the early infections occurred here, it's right along these forest zones that make a lot of sense from a zoonotic disease. But can I add one thing? It's right around along, uh, forest zones, but also along major trading routes. Yeah. Gekadu is a big trading junction that was also the site of several refugee camps during the Civil War. So there was a lot of population movement and displacement um, and very rapid uh, mobility um, that was happening uh, after the war in that region. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm a journalist. I'm reporting right now on the rollout of the convalescence serum trials. And um, a lot of the things you guys have talked about, you know, how much acquired immunity might be in West Africa from people, you know, what do we know about neutralizing antibodies? Science level is interesting, but I'm very interested now in the, both the, the silver lining, but also the possibility of uh, triggering more outbreaks now as we mobilize people. And I had a question from, from Mariam. 
Um, yep. About uh, earlier models, um, obviously there's been a lot of stigma around and will be around Ebola, and some people are wondering right now, because of both the failures and successes of community mobilization, whether or not, you know, this is like a month away, whether or not there's gonna be succeed or whether there's gonna be uh, real mistakes made. And it'll depend on how well community mobilization takes place because of these issues you've mentioned, stigma and others. I'm interested to know what positive lessons you might have seen, either other diseases and others, you know, on that level. And also with regard to questions of co-infection, one question has come up a lot with HIV, concerns about uh, increasing co-infection or not. So there's both the possibility of great uh, success right now and also some, some concerns. I'm interested from other panelists too, what you see with this rapid rollout that's gonna be involving people who have been possibly symptomatic, but looks like were symptomatic and survived as primary recruitments, but also others who have been around folks who didn't get sick. Sorry, so your, your question to me is, um, how can we tell whether there's gonna be a major crisis again or a, a radical improvement? Are there any signs that I've seen no, I, I was more like the positive lessons around community mobilization with these cultural aspects that would address based on either very recent lessons you've seen around addressing stigma that have come out, whether from rural chiefs or these community areas, to try to ad address the possibility of both the risk and the gain of rapid mobilizing of communities to try to participate in these kinds of trials. I said, did anyone bother calling a meeting with the elders of the secret society, chief them by chief them, and telling them what's going on, how it, it's, it's communicated, and could they uh, figure out ways of modifying what happens at their funerals and said, it turned out nobody had, and um, some, some of our colleagues in Sierra Leone um, have started having these meetings and have found great uh, receptiveness among these um, among these uh, people. I, I heard recently um, that a very well-known traditional healer actually stopped accepting patients and said, I really cannot handle this illness and started telling other traditional healers to do the same. And, advise most people who came to consult them to go to hospitals, to treatment units, to try and get tested, and so on and so forth. So people who are coming into contact with actual cases and see what it does to, um, to affected uh, people and to communities um, and the social fabric are actually um, responding um, and, and, and trying to find um, solutions. So I, I mean, I, I'm actually moderately optimistic about um, people keeping up, despite the lags, with the messages as they uh, change and trying to come up with creative uh, solutions. So I'm not entirely sure I understood the second part of your question, but if it relates to the fact that some people may be immune, either as a result of having recovered from Ebola or having antibodies and never having had Ebola, that's relevant, obviously, potentially in two areas. One is they may be able to safely care for sick people and be at less risk themselves. So if you can identify them and have them doing the burials or doing the patient care, they may have a, a, a greater safety until we can come up with a vaccine. Obviously, people are also working on, on uh, extracting antibodies from plasma uh, and, and setting up the facilities to do that safely. So if you're going to treat people with plasma from Ebola patients, you're not giving them hepatitis A, hepatitis B or C or HIV or, uh, or other things, but, but um, how, how effective those treatments will be is certainly unknown at the moment. But we wanna make sure they're at least safe in terms of other infectious agents. Hi, um, this may be just allowing Mariana to expound more about community mobilization. Um, I've been working in HIV prevention um, and social behavioral aspects of it for nearly three decades. 
And it's just struck me how little that we've learned from HIV has been used here. Um, and especially thinking about trying to mobilize communities, not just having a top-down approach, but mobilizing communities um, in ways that, so they, they understand how it's transmitted from person to person, and they're in, it's endorsed, you know, the preventive steps are endorsed by leaders and so forth. And it seems to me as, I haven't read academic papers about it, just the popular media, but it seems like almost nothing of that was done in the countries. And I'm wondering if you can say more about this issue about, I mean, it seems to me that that's one of the things when we think about a rapid a team approach that might go in. I mean, if we can contain this, when we contain this, we're still gonna have the potential for Ebola outbreaks in the future, now that we know it's from monkeys um, and bushmeat. So we've gotta prepare for it. And what kind of thinking is going on around that? Yeah, thanks for bringing up that point because you're, you're right on target. And one of the reasons, uh, in fact, a, a further parallel, um, in the stigma that surrounds this disease um, that um, uh, with HIV is, um, I don't know if Art mentioned this earlier because I missed his presentation entirely, but the aspect of intimacy in Ebola contagion, uh, I mean, semen, uh, breast milk are two of the bodily fluids in which, um, uh, you know, the virus uh, uh, lingers the longest. and. One of the things about uh, Ebola infection is that um, it also touches on sexual partnership and can be transmitted um, that way. Um, in, in one case, um, I heard about um, in uh, a different Ebola outbreak, uh, it was an affair between two individuals that was supposedly confirmed by the fact that they both died um, of uh, Ebola in very rapid succession. So um, some of the same stigmatizing uh, factors actually attend these two diseases. But um, there is a medical anthropologist, um, MD, Lin Kim Yen, who wrote about HIV mobilization in West Africa and who's also part of these conversations we're having uh, around this. And he actually made that very point, how little had been learned uh, from HIV mobilization um, and, and that wasn't applied. Uh, but there are people thinking about this um, uh, now and trying to um, enlist uh, communities. But I think the public health intervention model is so top down um, in, in these kind of biosecurity global pandemic um, uh, modes that um, Policymakers don't really have the time uh, uh, to consult uh, local communities. They they need to move fast and quickly and make major scaled up decisions and so on. So, but I think we're entering the phase where people are realizing they have to do this. Great, thank you. I think we have just one, and did I see another? Yeah, we've got two okay, more yeah, questions. Got yeah, okay, or three, but we'll have to go quick. <laughs> Yes, one, two, and then in the back. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. My name is Ava, and I'm absolutely sickened and galled that, yet again, we have another pandemic illness, and it's always resulting from Africa. It seems like everything bad and black and comes from Africa. Um, my belief system is that it was definitely transmitted by the WHO um, organizations and other organizations doing experiments with vaccines on African American, oh, excuse me, on the African population, whether it be the HIV, Ebola, or other for future pandemics which are going to occur, quote, in Africa. And the, um, so I'd like to address the panel as far as my belief system that the transmission of the diseases definitely came from vaccines. And if you've been taking that into account with your studies, appreciate an answer. Thank you. Well, first, let me say there are some notable diseases that haven't come from Africa. MERS and SARS are two uh, recent examples, so, and, and Nipah virus. So, so they haven't all come from Africa. Uh, I, I do have to say I, I don't share your opinion that, that uh, these diseases were, were the result of uh, experiments or, uh, or, the, or, or spread through vaccination. Now, it's certainly possible 
Uh, we know that, that the use of non-sterile needles and injection equipment can transmit Ebola and has transmitted hepatitis C and a variety of other infectious diseases. So uh, the lack of clean needles and syringes, whether for immunization or any other reason, is absolutely a threat and part of the impoverished infrastructure that's there. So that part of it I could agree with, but the notion that this has either been done intentionally or as a result of experiments, I guess the good news is I don't think any of our virologists are smart enough to create these things. So I, I would disagree with you about that part, but respectfully. Maybe one and then one more. And then okay, so um, yeah. my name is Michael. Uh, a, a comment and then a question. Um, Ms. Clear, I think you, you both raised it uh, in the sense that it's the infrastructure levels which are basically the real reservoir of the disease or the potential for the disease to spread. Um, and it's clear that uh, that's not an unaware characteristic of the, the continent in general and a, and a characteristic globally in certain areas. So to a certain extent, it's a decrepit financial system and the lack of investment to these areas which create this kind of potential for what is a global pandemic. Uh, I think even the head of Central Command, General Kelly, said that the potential for this to go to the Caribbean and to South America is very real. And then the questions of what happens in the United States is far different than a few airport travelers and so on. So this is a global question, and the development of Africa is a global moral question, which I think has to be addressed in the fact that our transatlantic financial system is more concerned about financial institutions which are bankrupt than the development of Africa is a real problem. On the other side, there is development taking place. Um, and so what, what about the collaboration of nations like China, Russia, and the United States in the mobilization of a disease of this nature now? I know there's been talk of the militarization, but clearly the militaries of some of these nations, specifically the United States and Russia, have significant capacity with naval ships, with the ability to take um, abandoned buildings, to turn them into some levels of hospital care, and to have a real emergency warlike mobilization of a biohazard-like situation um, as one of the most important ways, what was mentioned before of anthropological characteristics, the ability for this to spread into Central Africa, Kinshasa, is very real, it might already be happening, and as this thing spreads, it will be much harder to control if we don't get it at the source in West Africa this time. Well, I would only comment that obviously the potential for transmission in large cities, whether in the Middle East or in any place, is obviously a serious concern. Uh, you know, the militarization issue, the, the sad fact is the only organizations I know of that have the ability to rapidly put together a hospital uh, or a water treatment system or all the other things you might need in the face of a hurricane or an earthquake or a disaster are basically military organizations. Uh, public health uh, doesn't know how to do that. Professors don't know how to do that. Uh, generally, the private sector uh, doesn't do that very well. So uh, for better or worse, you know, that just has to be part of the response. People have talked about having, developing other types of rapid response capabilities that are not just epidemiologists or you know, people who can quickly test things or count things, but, but so far no one's been willing to invest in that that I know of. So I think there does need to be thought about the economic response and, and how countries can collaborate on that. Like one last yeah. quick question. <coughs> that is a time. general one. So what, what do we know and how should we think in general about viral outbreaks um, across diseases, not just one disease, and, and the rate at which um, they, they can occur and spread relative to our rate to respond, whether via vaccines, new medicines, education, transportation, communication. Just as a society, um, how should we be thinking about this challenge uh, for obviously individual health, but, but um, collective, uh, our own health as a species? Um, and, and those rates, you know, might be different with Spanish flu versus Ebola versus malaria versus TB, and um, <clears throat> you probably have some unique perspectives on that. Well, the whole issue of viral chatter, and you know, viruses and animals. As I said, Nathan Wolf works on this. Uh, there, there, are there are a variety of other people who are interested, who are quite clearly convinced that there are other threats uh, that that we as, as humans will encounter increasingly in the wild as we you know, go into ecologic spaces where we may not have been before and all these things. I'm frankly skeptical that we'll be able to identify in animals those viruses in advance that pose a real threat to humans. I know that Nathan doesn't agree with me about that, but, but that's my 
view on that. So I, I'm not convinced we can go out and find these things before they make people sick and develop vaccines and get people to take them and, and do that in response to specific threats. But you won't be surprised to know as a public health person, I think strengthening public health infrastructure mm -hmm. and ability to respond to problems in general would be money well spent, whether in West Africa uh, or in any other setting. And the sad fact is, after 9-11, after things like this, there's this enormous blip, there's a huge infusion of resources, and then 10 years later, it's basically dissipated and back to business as usual. Hopefully not in this case, <laughs> although, yes, we have history to learn from. <laughs> but we also have run out of time, um, and so I just want to thank um, Ayan for being with us all the way from the Netherlands, and Art, and Justin, thank you so much, and for you. Great. Opened up the complexity behind this free topic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.